deep in the taiga, where humans are a rare sight, lies the beginning of Siberia's giant river, the Lena. Gathering strength with each bend, it finally flows into the Arctic Ocean, 4,000 kilometers away from its source. In places, it cuts a 30 kilometer wide expanse of water into the Eurasian continent. The taiga surrounding the Lena's source is like an ocean, endless, immeasurable, and dangerous. But it is habitat to many forest dwellers who go about their lives and call it home. The taiga also opens itself up to people who know and respect the laws of the forest. Our film is about the mysterious beginnings of the Lena River, its rapids and dark ancient woods. Our journey to the source of the Lena begins in Irkutsk, a town also referred to as the capital of Siberia. As the crow flies, it's over 4,000 kilometers from Moscow, almost 6,000 from Berlin, but twice closer to Tokyo. A 200 kilometer drive from Irkutsk takes us to the Biryulka Taiga village. Biryolka is an ordinary Siberian village, like thousands of its kind, where village streets are as deep as they are wide, and hospitality is ingrained into local culture. The villagers insist that Biryolka is the last village in the Lena with permanent inhabitants. As we've seen quite a bit of the world on our filming expeditions, we don't attach too much importance to the truthfulness of this statement, but choose this village as the starting point of our filming journey. The gentleman with the blue backpack is Vasily, and carrying the red, Riho. The cameramen working behind the scenes are Arvo and Josef. These forests used to be home to the Tunguzic people. Now called Evenks, they have become scattered in the Siberian taiga, and it's quite possible that even Gennady's ancestors might have been part Tunguzic. This leads us to believe that we could not have found a better guide. As of today, we trust ourselves to Gennady's care. 
We are embarking on a 300 kilometer taiga journey and it's not going to be easy. That much we know. The river is the taiga's artery and often the only transportation route, much like a road. Gennady has the typical local transportation, a spacious boat with great capacity. The flat bottom allows it to pass through stretches of shallow water and to be dragged over sandbanks when needed. to Beryulka, or upwards, as the locals say. The Lena runs through mountains. The flow is rapid, and the going gets exciting. We know that the last segment of our journey will be by land. Sandbanks, rocks, trees fallen into water. A million reasons for an accident to happen. Nothing intimidates Gennady. By nightfall, we reach Chonchur village, where lovely log cabins contradict the notion of the deserted wild taiga. This village is like thousands of its kind in the rest of the world. People have left for the cities in search of work, and houses slowly wither away. Mihailich, the only permanent inhabitant of the village, seems to hang in there, spending the greater part of the year all alone. His grandchild, who visits in the summer, helps him keep in touch with the world beyond, from which Mihailich has secluded himself by choice. Passing Chonchur village, we reach the Baikal Lena Nature Reserve. It's closed to the public, but our team has been given a permit. This is what the forest looks like in a nature reserve where two to three generations of rangers have foregone improvement cutting. The trees fall into the river, forming impenetrable mazes. Such piles are called lums. Driftwood and branches sometimes block the river completely. Gennady tells us about a legendary pile on the Lena, persisting some 10 years already, a Kurumlinski lum. Each year when summer begins and the water recedes after spring floods, foresters come and cut a narrow tunnel through the maze so that boats may pass. Nevertheless, it's still easy to break a prop or even a bone while balancing on the piles. Thank you. 
Mazes like these are the favorite habitat of otters and American minks, though the mink is not a native species. It was introduced as a pioneer population after the Second World War. Now, it occupies the entire river, having slowly chased down sables and otters. A similar thing has happened in Estonia, where the American mink has essentially driven out the local European mink. Aggressive as it is, it doesn't mind posing for our camera. The local people also accuse the American mink of destroying the Lena's already diminished fish stock. Waters form several shallow branches, so we have no choice but to drag the boat over sandbanks again and again. Finally, we give up and climb to dry land. We must wait here for the horsemen. Who knows what landmarks Gennady and the horsemen used to arrange the meeting. The important thing is that the horses are now here and will carry our packs, just as in ancient journeys and expeditions. A long time ago, the native Avenk people also kept reindeer and used them as pack animals. The Avenk trails exist no more. We are now in the true ancient taiga and can say with a touch of poetic license that no tree here has been felled by human hand. So we find in the Rousseauian words of Sauer, an 18th century traveler, 
a wild, romantic solitude that nourishes the soul. On the other hand, getting lost here would not be a good idea. Our Gennady resembles a native of rainforests, going before us and swinging his axe to make way for the horses. Along the way, Gennady strikes fresh axe marks and refreshes old ones on tree trunks. This is important for future passages and for marking our return trail. The marshy areas in the taiga are extremely difficult to pass on foot, not to mention with horses. This time we make the risky decision to go straight through the marsh. Preparing food is easy in the taiga, as there is an abundance of firewood. At the same time, utmost care must be taken to prevent accidental sparks. Summertime forest fires are a regular menace in the Baikal Lena Nature Reserve. During heavy rain or slight frost, a fire helps pass the night under a tree. One must prepare for all circumstances when on the taiga. Our horseman's hunting husky has woken up a sable. These old forest fire sites are a favorite hunting ground of the sable, a crafty predator. No chance spotting it without a husky. The husky and the hunter are truly an inseparable unit on the taiga.
But today marks the entrance of our star, the brown bear, although it's giving only preliminary warnings for the time being. Gennady continues to find its feces on the ground and territorial markings on trees. A professional hunter covers daily about 15 to 20 kilometers of ground on the taiga. This is the reference distance for building hunting cabins, sometimes called winter cabins, though they're also used in summer. We take shelter here as well. We find a stove sleeping bunks, and dishes. Food should not be left in the cabin. Mice quickly eat it, and if a bear should find the scent, chaos would ensue. Food supplies and winter clothes are kept in a pillar storehouse. We keep going deeper into the taiga, and we find more traces of human presence. Poles for conic huts placed against tree trunks, wooden household objects, hunting traps. Could these be remnants of the travels of the Evenks as they passed through these areas? The former Soviet regime's attempts to force a sedentary life on nomadic nations scattered the Evenks into solitary taiga villages. Little by little, we move upwards into the mountains. The taiga recedes to the mountain slope, giving way to low scrub, which covers the entire river bank a rather unpleasant place for travelers. Moose seem to rather like the scrub as a foraging ground, shed antlers, hoof prints. As we know, moose and deer also attract bear.
We've had plenty of time, and the distances have grown smaller accordingly. We are almost at the headwaters of the Lena. The horses are unable to keep traction on the slippery stone plates, and so we send our able helpers back. The husky returns as well. One more day of hiking. We ascend above the tree line and find ourselves in the world of high mountains. The Lena has dwindled into a small creek and can be crossed anywhere we like. The river's source should be somewhere close. This lovely small mountain lake is where the giant Lena is born. We cannot resist the temptation to quote Robert Peary, the first traveler to reach the North Pole on foot. Is this it? On the other side of this mountain range lies the enormous Lake Baikal, which the locals refer to as the sea. We're not going there this time. We stay in the taiga. We settle into a hunting cabin and make the customary preparations. While we're not going to spend the entire winter here, more than a month spent in the taiga on our own is still an exciting prospect. And then we send home our guide, Gennady, to meet him again in early winter. We don't consider ourselves confused romantics who may or may not pull this off. This is not survival training. We are experienced filmmakers, and months-long expeditions in various corners of the world are part of our everyday routine. Our aim is to film the life of the true master of these forests, the brown bear. Every morning we leave behind our hunting cabin and step into the taiga. We carry a camera instead of guns. Our trail passes under a magical forest crown consisting of Siberian pines, many more than 600 years old.
The Siberian pine is the only nut-bearing tree in the Siberian taiga. Its tasty and nutritious nuts are the main food for all members of the forest fauna, and for people as well. Nature has arranged it so that Siberian pine seeds are not able to spread with the wind, unlike pine, fir, or larch seeds. Therefore, they need help with reproduction. This aid operation is led by a bird by the name of Nutcracker. The nutcracker prepares food stores, dispersing the pine seeds in the taiga and hiding them in small portions. Experts claim that a nutcracker can make up to 30,000 personal stores each year. Can you believe this workaholic? Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that the birds later find all the thousands of stores and hidden nuts intact. Some of the forgotten seeds take root in the spring, while many stores are looted by chipmunks. The chipmunks living in this circular mountain range are particularly crafty at using the services of nutcrackers. They pry the nutcracker stores open with impeccable technique and carry the loot to their dens. In addition, they pick the pine cones dropped under trees by nutcrackers and empty them of nuts. But this requires constantly venturing outside their territories. Pine cones lying on the ground are usually already empty. The birds leave only the bad nuts inside. It remains a mystery for us how they tell the good from the bad. Science doesn't explain it all as an old Siberian hunter once said. These striped tricksters weigh so little that they effortlessly climb trees if there aren't enough nuts on the ground. The chipmunks have their own store economy. They dig caches under the roots of old pines, sometimes said to contain up to three kilos of nuts. And then a bear comes along in search of the chipmunk's nut stores. This is how catering works in the taiga. The Evenks have their own legend about the stripes on chipmunk backs. A long, long time ago, a chipmunk and a bear argued about who was quicker and more agile. The argument heated up and the angry bear grazed the chipmunk with his paw. Hence, the claw marks on the chipmunk's back. But the chipmunk ended up winning the argument and taking off. Ever since then, the bear is always trying to drag the chipmunk out of its den to resume the argument. The bears are supposed to come to this valley in the autumn to fatten themselves with the nuts stored by the chipmunks. Obviously, they're not yet here today. All we see in the forest are last year's ransacked chipmunk dens. Meeting a bear in the taiga requires extraordinary luck and chance. 
the vast expanses and uncharted territory add to the trickiness, or more precisely, the hopelessness of the situation. We're at a loss, and finally decide to craft a lure for the bear, the way hunters have always done. Near a chipmunk den, we place in the ground some pine cones, canned meat, condensed milk, and other food leftovers, topped off with a stinking rotten egg mixture. This stench should radiate over several kilometers. But there are no takers. Only our old friends, the Nutcracker and Chipmunk, pose for the camera. It seems that bears have not yet arrived. The first cold September night closed the forest with a new suit. Only the pines keep their conservative look and do not change color. The autumn beauty comes and goes quickly in the taiga. One morning we wake up to a frozen, silent world. The newly fallen snow should make us happy, as it shouldn't be difficult to spot bear tracks on fresh snow. The first snow usually scares the cautious animals, and they prefer to stay hidden. We know this and lay low as well. The first animals appear only a couple of days later, but no bear. The snow keeps falling, and the mountains are covered with a thick white blanket. What's a man to do without skis in the taiga? We no longer go on long outings. A true hunting story needs to have a bit of luck. When we return from the last attempt, fresh bear tracks await us. Большой, большой 
Смотри, всего лишь навсего в 200 метрах от нашего домика. The brown bear, Ursus Arctus. For some, the king of the taiga. For native peoples, the son of the supreme god, Toru. It's now our turn to say, is this it? Gennady is back, and he's accompanied by horses. We start on our way. We know there will probably be no next time. We're not likely to find ourselves back in this hunting cabin. Those coming after us will find several weeks worth of food supplies and a thoroughly redecorated hunting cabin. We leave the source of Elena, but not Elena herself. Four thousand kilometers to the north, before water gathered from mountaintops is ceremonially handed over to the ocean. The Lena forms a delta of 150 branches. Each spring, the Lena Delta, with its rough nature and climate, attracts millions of birds and animals. But what effect has it on people? We head to the Arctic Ocean in search of an answer. 